Hey, welcome to another episode. You're listening to Data Science at Home podcast, the show that brings knowledge about machine learning, data science, and algorithms straight to your ears. I'm your host, Francesco, and today I'm speaking about one of the most recent topics that has hit the news, a model that comes from the NLP community, natural language processing, and the model goes under the name of GPT-3. You probably have heard of it. It's uh, the sequel of uh, an, a series of models, in fact, r- released by OpenAI. And uh, this model apparently is going to change the way we think about many of the processes that we are used to deal with, starting from, of course, text manipulation, uh, language modeling, um, and much more apparently, because there are uh, a number of demos that are really impressive. So what I would like to do in this episode is to clarify why uh, some people are really excited about it. And uh, probably it would be better to give you my point of view on the on the subject. I, I have a few opinions about uh, what this model can do. And uh, also I would discourage the hype around it uh, due to many reasons that I will explain in this show. I hope I will do a decent job to explain what, what GPT-3 is and uh, what are the what's the potential of such a model and why um, certain things are um, closer to the hype around artificial intelligence rather than real things. But let's start from the beginning. And so let's start with explaining what GPT is. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Data Science at Home podcast with Francesco Gadaletta. You are about to get cutting edge insights from the people who are reshaping the world of technology with machine learning, data science, and artificial intelligence. It's time for Data Science at Home. Welcome to the show. So GPT-3, uh, in fact, is, the, as I said, the continuation of a work that has started with an architecture that comes from the deep learning community, uh, which is the transformer architecture and that's one of the most powerful architectures that we um, have so far um, it it works very well across domains across different data types it's uh, almost completely unsupervised so it's something that we have explained in other episode in another episode that I will definitely report in the show notes of this one as always so feel free to get back to that episode and understand uh, what uh, the transformer architecture can do for you whenever you deal with deep learning. Now, GPT in a nutshell does something that is extremely simple. It takes a bunch of words, which is called the context, and of course tries to guess what is the word that comes after that context. So imagine you have this large digitized book uh, and uh, you basically uh, start sliding from, uh, you know, in, you take windows of words in which, for example, the context is defined as uh, 20 words. And what you are trying to do is guessing what the 21st word is going to be given the first 20 ones, right? And so when you do that, what happens is that you are training, in fact, a probabilistic model that tries to guess what this 21st word would be. And then you keep moving, you know, maybe you can move word by word. And so the next context is going to be the next 20 words or you can overlap these words. You know, you can have several flavors. The way you build this training set is really not very important at this point in time. But essentially, that's exactly what the GPT family of uh, models do, right? Now, instead of a digitized book, if in your training set you have something like uh, Reddit threads as well as Wikipedia archive, or you have many other publicly available web pages that are out there and that can be scraped around the internet and you start building these massive uh, hundreds of gigabytes of uh, of material and then you start of course training this very simple model on uh, on a very large machines for example those equipped with hundreds of gpus well it happens that these models start learning uh, very interesting things and so what these models can do after training it's something that seems like magic because in fact they can well they become very very good at guessing this uh, next word after a certain context they become extremely good at that and not only that they they become very good generative models because once you give it these models a seed which is you start typing some words 
uh, that make more or less sense. You know, these are uh, kind of structured sentences uh, that you know make sense in the English language. Well, when you start giving this context, um, the network will start will continue uh, generating text that is coherent, is consistent with the the seed that you just gave them. That's where the magic is. Now, the thing is that the way such a model is trained is not magic nor mysterious at all. And I want to be clear on this because there is a lot of journalists out there, as always, when whenever OpenAI builds something that uh, makes something that you know is human, it can be understood by the community or by uh, non-technical people, and it does something that is, uh, let's say, closer and closer to what human beings are, are used to do, well, then people start misunderstanding and uh, they start believing that, in fact, we are probably in front of an AGI. AGI, for those who are not familiar with the, with the acronym, stands for Artificial General Intelligence, which is uh, the kind of stuff that people like Ben Gertzel uh, keep claiming since a decade already. And uh, it's basically the way, uh, you know, it's this new generation of artificial intelligence that would eventually give a superhuman powers to a machine but i'm not gonna get there you guys have your own opinion i believe that this is not even close to agi this is in fact a probabilistic model and uh, it is not magic at all to my eyes due to the fact that given a bunch of words the model is asked to predict the next word that makes the most sense in that particular context and that's it now an old good statistician would do this with a markov process or another probabilistic approach that could lead to similar results. The problem is that, well, and that's a problem, not really, it's like a characteristic of the GPT-3 model, is that it's doing this, you know, this guess the word game, with something like 175 billion parameters. Yes, 175 billion parameters. The input tax is nothing more than whatever is publicly available from the internet, discussion forums, Reddit threads, digitized books, websites, Wikipedia itself, and much more. So whatever you can reach from your laptop and an internet connection, it, it was probably very, very likely part of the training set of this amazing result. And uh, I'm quoting amazing because, you know, it doesn't really sound amazing to me. I mean, if you have at your disposal gigabytes and gigabytes of text and uh, 175 billion parameters, you know, I'm not impressed, honestly, because this model resemble more the features of a lookup table rather than a uh, an artificial general intelligence or an artificial intelligence. But of course, you know, I would like to um, have your opinions on the topic. So uh, do not hesitate to jump on the, our Discord channel the link will be provided in the show notes of this episode. Uh, it's our official Discord channel where you can come and uh, chat with us about previous episodes. You can also propose new ones. We always welcome folks who are interested in uh, proposing new episodes and new topics for sure. Now, how do you use GPT-3? Well, using GPT-3 is very simple, in fact, provided one has a very large machine packed with GPUs. And, uh, well, using GPT-3, in fact, can be done in three easy steps. In the first one, you provide a description of the task that you would like the network to solve for you. Uh, for example, translate English to French, right? And in the second step, you provide an example. This, in fact, can be optional. Uh, for example, you would say, the chair equal uh, la chaise, which in French is uh, the chair. And so what you are creating here is a context, right? And then in the third step, you provide so-called unseen case in which you write the table equal and, and you ask the network to continue that text. And what happens is that magically, <laughs> GPT-3 will make a translation for you and will generate the translation of, uh, of table in French, which I personally do not know. So I'm going to ask GPT-3 what that word would be. In fact, GPT-3 behaves, as I said, just like a massive lookup table. And uh, being it a, a model of 175 billion parameters, I mean, guys, this is impressive. 
it's 10 times bigger than the previous version of GPT, uh, which was GPT-2, uh, that had something like, I think, 15 or 17 billion parameters, which is already insane. It's already insane. It's very hard to believe that such a network does some form of generalization due to the number of parameters that we are dealing with. I find it very hard to believe that these models can generalize. In fact, these models, in my opinion, do not generalize. These models will uh, basically parrot what they have already encountered in the input during training with some perturbation, of course. It does not even perform uh, backpropagation due to the massive amount of parameters uh, it is equipped with. Now, does it sound intelligent to you? I, I don't know. I, it, it doesn't to me. Probably the most intelligent component of GPT-3 is in the transformer architecture that I've discussed uh, quite extensively in another podcast episode. As I said, I will report that in the show notes of this one. So what do people think of GPT-3? Well, among many practitioners, there's been a lot of uh, uh, you know activities <laughs> behind the scenes. People who have been creating a lot of demos that are based on GPT-3. Some of them are really cool, I must say. I mean, there is something that is really, really interesting and uh, definitely fancy to watch. But among many, uh, for example, one that I remember top of my head is, uh, uh, of course, a way to summarize books or uh, another one to forge email replies for you. Now, there is one in particular that has hit the news uh, a number of times already and also caught my attention, which is computer programming. So there has been an attempt to let GPT-3 generate source code for you, starting from a description of how a certain web application would look like. And so you can describe, for example, the Google web page in plain English, and the GPT-3 model will start generating the code that, in fact, is the Google web page. <laughs> so you can render that code in your browser and boom, you have Google. Now, this is insane. You know, imagine if you could describe web applications in plain English and get your, your, your source code as a result. Imagine how powerful would that be? How many jobs we would lose like the day after? That would lead people to believe that we no longer need, for example, software developers. Now, let's be serious here. We have a model that is great at looking at a bunch of words and predict the next most appropriate word. Since each word is converted to a numeric vector, because, you know, computers are good with numbers, right? So there's no way, no way such a model would understand what that text is about, except under the terms of you know, topic classification. It cannot even know how that text is generated. Again, the only task that GPT-3 can perform is guessing one word given a certain context. So now let me go back to the computer programming task. But you know, what I'm trying to say here can be generalized easily across domains or applications and use cases. So coding is the result of several skills and capabilities that definitely go beyond language syntax. As you know, code can be elegant, it can be short, abstract, highly maintainable, and it usually follows certain engineering principles, right? Software engineering. Of course, I'm, I'm referring to proper programming. There's no spaghetti coding involved here. While all this might be observed directly from the source code, it cannot be easily separated from it. So you can understand, for example, if you look at some code, you can understand that that code is following certain principles, not all of them, but you know, by looking at a certain context in, in that particular library or source files, you can understand if certain programming principles are observed. You can understand if code is elegant, for example. Um, if you're a good programmer, you have, you know, probably learned these things, these abstractions, and, uh, and you could capture them by reading the source code. But even a good programmer cannot easily separate this. So you cannot easily, for example, if you never encountered or you, you never studied a, a software engineering principle, 
you cannot really abstract it from the source code by looking only at the source code. This is something that is extremely difficult to do because it's in the source code, but the source code itself doesn't give you any hint, definitely not directly, about the engineering principle that have been applied for that particular source code. Now, let me explain the same concept in the language of so-called real engineers. Real just because they build something tangible, something that we can we can kick or, or, or touch. For example, buildings or bridges, right? So if you look at a million of buildings or bridges, this task of observing buildings, of looking around you, it can tell us a lot about the material, about their shape, but very little about the construction principles and the geology, for example, that are all required for a building to be safe, durable, resilient, and many other properties that we want from buildings and bridges. Now, another big problem is, and that comes from machine learning, in fact, from machine learning algorithms, is that they can only learn from data. So when such data is biased, incomplete, or just inaccurate, an observation of the phenomenon that you're observing will be extrapolated, and that will also be biased, incomplete, and inaccurate. The third biggest problem is that GPT-3 needs an enormous amount of unbiased data. And the internet is exactly the place that lacks such a requirement. And so that's another problem that I would see, you know, garbage in, garbage out, we say in machine learning, which is, if your data sucks or is inaccurate, is biased, well, so will the result be. And so the model will be biased, will be inaccurate, and will be unbalanced. Not to mention the fact that good developers and, of course, human beings do not need to read about, for example, pointers in C or C++ or lifetimes in, in Rust uh, a million times for them to understand this concept and master them. In addition to this, a model that learns the way GPT-3 does is a probabilistic model. Developers do not write code on a probabilistic basis. <laughs> not even those who, who copy-paste from Stack Overflow. Psh, that burns, guys, I know. So, to be clear one more time, when it comes to coding skills, GPT-3 is definitely similar to a developer who has some familiarity with the syntax of programming language, but he doesn't know any type of abstraction behind such a language, and who is constantly referring to a massive dictionary of coding snippets. Imagine if on Stack Overflow you only had coding snippets. That's it. That, I think, is the fairest comparison I can make when I, have, when I think about GPT-3 as a developer. And so I would definitely not be concerned of killing his job or her job. I'm more concerned that such a coder was in my team in the first place. So whenever you read about GPT-3 is going to kill software developer jobs, do not worry. Just flag that journalist because that guy is probably going to say another bull in the immediate future. That's it for today. Thanks for joining us this week on Data Science at Home. Make sure to visit our website on datascienceathome.com where you can subscribe to the show in Apple Podcast, Stitcher, Spotify, or even via RSS so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, if you find value in this show, I would appreciate a rating on Apple Podcast or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help me a lot too. Ciao! You've been listening to Data Science at Home Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or Podbean to get new, fresh episodes. For more, please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, or visit our website at datascienceathome.com.